What's up everybody, Rob here. So this is, I wouldn't say an off-the-cuff video, I have been thinking about it for a while, but at the same time, it's not really a formal video. This is history related, but I'm not gonna be talking about any specific thing. It's not gonna be my normal history videos. It's just something that um, came up and I've been thinking about it and I figured I'd share my thoughts on it with all of you. So yeah, I'm not. it's gonna be somewhat rambly, but then again, that's pretty expected of me. Any case, uh, a couple of weeks ago, well, about two months ago over there, but whatever, uh, a while ago, I did a video about Maurice of Nassau, who reintroduced linear tactics into warfare. Uh, part of my ongoing series about early modern warfare, basically the post-medieval world, the, what happened after the Middle Ages. And uh, basically there were pike blocks and, the, and you know just thick, heavy phalanx-type formations, very similar to what the Macedonians used and the ancient Greeks used. And that eventually gave way to the linear formations of Maurice of Nassau. And then this basic linear just means in a line. So basically longer, well, longer lines They have these thick blocks. They're much thinner, but they take up more frontage. It, I actually have videos on them and you should totally check them out. But in any case, Maurice of Nassau came up with this idea and eventually it would be improved upon by Gustavus Adolphus. And it would, um, it would have great effect against the Spanish Tercio, which was still using the thicker, heavier pike block formations. And it basically became the main method of warfare after they were introduced. Everybody saw them and said, oh, this is really cool. Let's totally do that. But um, it was brought up on the video I made about Maurice of Nassau that a Spanish tercio, or well, yeah, it was a Spanish tercio, but it was um, an imperial tercio. Uh, during the Battle of Nordlingen in 1634, they won a victory against the Swedish who were using these linear formations. So the point being, though, if these linear formations were superior and by all accounts, they generally were. How is it that the this Spanish Tercio was able to defeat this more uh, superior formation? And that's a very good question, and I'm going to hopefully try to answer that. Now, not that specifically, not that particular battle, because that's not really the point, but I figured I'd bring it into a larger context about, uh, just say, victory conditions in general. And like, what, how is victory achieved on a battlefield between two opposing armies? So if you have been following my videos about early modern warfare, or if you've just been studying this topic on your own, you'll see a recurrent theme, and it's one of constant innovation and new technology. And generally speaking, the side with the newest innovation and the newest technology would be the victorious side. So to start out with, you have the high Middle Ages, uh, not the high Middle Ages, the late Middle Ages, where you have guys in full plate armor on horseback, they're charging in and just smashing their opponents uh, just with massed cavalry charges. Well, then they run into a bunch of Swiss pikemen. Now, just presume that the pike, it's an ancient weapon, but then they rediscovered it. Just assume it's the new innovation. Okay, you have the older method of knights on horseback. They run into pike blocks. Pike blocks are obviously superior. Okay, and then you incorporate firearms into it, and then next thing you know, you have pike and shot formations, which eventually led to the tercio, and the tercio was dominant, and people then tried to copy the tercio. And then the linear formations, Maurice of Nassau, Gustavus Adolphus showed up. Uh, Gustavus Adolphus further on included things like combined arms, um, utilizing artillery, cavalry, along with the infantry together, and so on, and everybody looked at that. They were victorious, generally speaking, and I'll get to the, yes, I did talk about Nordlingen, but you know, just work with me here for a minute. Um, okay, so everybody then decided to, okay, we're going to do that now. And then this, uh, the pike and shot would eventually be replaced by the flintlock. You know, um, eventually, well, pike and shot's uh, formations would use the matchlock musket. The matchlock would be replaced by the flintlock. And the pike would be replaced by the bayonet, particularly the socket bayonet, which allowed you to fire it and um, have the bayonet fixed at the same time. I'm going to be doing a video on that. I didn't get there, but it will happen eventually. But in any case, new technology... New, these new innovations would come about and they would be successful and everybody would adopt it, thusly pushing on the march of technology, et cetera, et cetera, all the way to the modern day, really. However, the issue comes up with their, the exceptions. And for example, the Battle of Nordlingen or later on the Battle of Fontenoy, in which case the British who were using uh, flintlocks with bayonets attached to them ran up against the, um, the French who were still using matchlocks. And they were defeated in both cases. And so the question is, well, if these new methods are superior, the technology is superior, how is it that they were defeated? And uh, that's pretty much what I'm going to talk about. Just really quickly, uh, nothing, this is just more of an informal thing. And um, really, it's about well, what it takes to cause a victory. So technology is not the only factor. So one factor, in addition to technology, is one of sheer numbers. For example, famously at the Battle of Insan Luana, which I know I'm mispronouncing, but you know that's the best you're going to get out of me. 
about 20,000 Zulu managed to defeat 1,800 British soldiers. Now, the British were vastly technologically superior. They had repeating firearms, all standard um, standardized type, the Martini Henry Mark I, if I'm not mistaken, which was a rolling block. Basically, if you haven't seen it, just watch the movie Zulu, which actually took place at the Battle of Rourke's Drift, which was the next day. Basically, you fire the thing, then you, um, you work a lever, the... Shell casing is ejected, you take a new round, you shove it into the chamber, you close it, you aim, you fire, you repeat. You get, if you know what you're doing, you can get about you know, 15 to 20 shots off per minute with this. The Zulu did not have this. They did have some firearms, which they had either purchased or captured, which they did not know how to use effectively because, you know, you actually have to know how to use firearms. It's not as simple as, you know, lining up the sights and pulling the trigger. You got to know how to do it properly, and you have to know how to coordinate with other people using it and... Um, the Zulu did not have the training that the British did. So technologically, the British were vastly superior to the Zulu. But the Zulu, because of British incompetence and a whole bunch of factors, which I'm, well, I'll briefly get into it here, uh, they were able to just swarm over the, um, the Zulu were able to just swarm over the British. So, for example, uh, the British were in skirmisher, skirmish formation, because they were taking some fire from the Zulu. But it was ineffective. It was a lot of the shots were uh, simply overshooting the British and the British were in skirmish formation with several feet between each soldier. And the bulk of the Zulu army was not equipped with firearms. They were equipped with melee weaponry, particularly their short spears, which I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce and clubs as well. And they have their famous shield. I mean, you guys should know how a Zulu are equipped. Any case, any case, the Zulu, the absolute fantastic runners that they were, they just ran up close to the British, got, they got, they took some casualties on the way in. I'm just not, I'm not going to say it was a complete trouncing there. I mean, they, they took a several hundred, if not over a thousand plus casualties. I don't know the exact figures off the top of my head. They, they, they took some heavy casualties, too, but once they were able to get amongst the British, because the British were in this light skirmisher-type formation, they were able to just surround individual British soldiers. You know, like, you've known, if you know anything about uh, melee combat like this, formation is key, and the British were essentially out of formation. They were in skirmish formation, which is great if you're being shot at by effective enemy fire, but not so great when you have a melee-centric enemy swarming over you and they outnumber you more than 10 to 1. So because of just sheer numbers, the technology of the British was simply not uh, able to cope with that. Also, on top of this too, that leads to another issue, which is knowing your enemy, basically leadership, knowing what you're up against and um, combating them effectively. The British were in the skirmish formation because they were set up to fight against an army that was basically shooting at them, which the Zulu were, but not very effectively when they, if they had adopted a, well, a shoulder to shoulder, you know, classic Napoleonic style linear formation, they could have delivered volley after volley into the Zulu. And if the Zulu did get close enough, they would have this wall of bayonets to deal with. Would it have helped them? Maybe, maybe not. Again, we're playing the what if, history thing here you know we don't know how it would have turned out but it wouldn't have been as much of a disaster they would have had at least more of a fighting chance and what i'm trying to make here is that yes although the british did have at insan lawana superior technology they weren't able to utilize it properly and zulu numbers simply were able to overwhelm them so in this particular case numbers trumped technology Another factor that could play a part in victory outside of technology was terrain. For example, if you hold a high ground, if you've ever seen the prequels, you know exactly what I'm talking about here. But uh, all jokes aside, if you have the high ground, you have a marked advantage. You have the momentum going downhill. It's easier to go downhill than uphill. If you're going uphill, you're having a bad time because you're going to be exhausted by the time you get to the top of the hill. And it's uh, just more difficult going. Uh, if anything, if nothing else, your opponents can uh, roll rocks and logs and stuff down at you, which would suck. And also makes shooting back at your enemy if you have ranged weaponry much more difficult. For example, at the Battle of Gettysburg, before the picket Pettigrew charge kicked off, the Confederates commenced an artillery bombardment against the Union positions. They were shooting uphill, and because of this, most of their shots were actually flying over the Union lines and landing harmlessly behind them. So their preparatory bombardment was having very, very little effect. Whereas the Union cannon, because they were on the high on the heights, um, they basically held the high ground, 
when they did return fire, once the infantry stepped off and began their assault, they were able to just pick apart, well, best not pick apart, um, actually just blast apart the Confederate formations because they were shooting downhill and that gave them the marked advantage. Technology notwithstanding, holding the high ground gives an army particular advantage. And in the case of Gettysburg, it was the high ground that gave the Union the advantage. Actually, the whole point of the battle was the Confederates, uh, the Union army on these high grounds and the Confederates trying to... Um, to throw them off of the, the heights and failing every single time. Other factors that work in an army's favor as well. For example, the Battle of Thermopylae. Yes, it was a Greek and or Spartan defeat, but they were able to inflict much higher casualties on their Persian adversaries because the Persians, although they outnumbered their opponents, um, they were funneled into a very small area and their numbers were unable to count. Now, this has nothing to do with technology necessarily, but again, terrain does play a major part in the victory. Or it was a defeat, but you, you you know what I'm trying to say here. So terrain is another factor in uh, winning a battle, um, again, outside of the realms of technology. And uh, those are, like, when it comes to numbers or terrain, that's pretty objective. Okay, you have the high ground, you outnumber your opponent by a certain amount. Okay, but what about things that are subjective? Or uh, if not subjective, at least more difficult to measure. For example, um, logistics, which win wars. I mean, that's what made the Romans as effective as they were. They were masters at logistics. They were able to supply their soldiers, keep them fed and um, equipped in an appropriate manner. And that was one of probably their greatest advantage over their opponents. Yes, they did have a technological advantage over many of their, um, their adversaries, particularly the tribes in Gaul and the Britons and the, the Germans that they fought against. Even though they were vastly outnumbered, they did have the technology, yes, a technological advantage, but they also had a massive logistical one. They didn't have to worry as much as often about um, their soldiers going hungry. They were, they were able to keep their soldiers fed. Any weaponry or other piece of equipment that was broken, they could replace it that much more effectively. And that meant when their soldiers were actually put into the field, they were able to fight much more effectively. And also something else that's pretty intangible, but also equally as important, would be morale and discipline. So, I mean, can your army hold the line, or will they break and run if they start taking casualties? And the Romans, again, were very good at this. They actually had a guy, the second in command of each century. You have the centurion out in front, and the second in command was a uh, position known as an opito. Optio? Optio. Yes. Uh, foreign words, me, not happening. Any I'm doing this off the top of my head, so just bear with me. Any case... Uh, his job would be to stand behind the sentry, and if guys were to run, his he would take his symbol of office, which is basically this big stick, and he would start whacking people to get them back into position. So because of their discipline, when other armies would have broken and run because they didn't have this officer in the back um, you know, guiding and directing people, the Romans were able to stay in line because, look, I could charge my enemies— yeah, or I could, you know, stay and, you know, fight my enemies, or I can bolt and run, but if I try to bolt and run, more than likely I'm going to get whacked in the face by this guy, and then if we survive the battle, I'm probably going to be executed as a coward. So, you know what, I'm just going to stand and fight, because I got my better chance, a better chance fighting against the enemy than if, um, you know, Roman justice takes over. So because of Roman discipline, and this also goes back to training and uh, practice, they were able to, you know, basically hold the line, and if things were looking tough, they were able to just, you know, stay there and grind it out. And, um, you know, eventually triumph over their enemies, even though their enemy had vastly superior tech, um, vastly superior numbers or some cases technology, again, for example, the uh, Assassinids with their cataphracts and all that. Um, they were able to hold the line and uh, basically triumph and were victorious and created one of the greatest empires in history because of this discipline. Now, it's very difficult to. Uh, put a number on this like you know uh, you know to quantify this it's it's more of a subjective thing but they had that morale they had that um esprit de corps i guess you could say they had that willingness to hold the line and not break when the going got bad at least not very often it did happen of course but it didn't really happen as often it's, there's a mindset to it which you can't really calculate but because of that and the romans had this they were able to triumph and again, this goes outside of technology. It's just one way to basically win a battle outside of superior technology. And you can apply this during all – I'm using specific examples throughout history because that's what's coming to mind. But you can apply this to any particular time period. So there's also just plain happenstance. For example, at the Battle of Hastings, 1066, William the Conqueror, or at the, as he was known at the time, William the Bastard. And yes, I get to call somebody the Bastard, so I'm going to take advantage. Uh, he – 
there was a rumor going around that he was dead, that he had been killed. He hadn't been killed, but his army was breaking in ready to run. It's entirely, entirely possible that if he actually had been killed, the Normans would have deserted and fled the field, and that would have been a Saxon victory. He had to run up and down the lines on his horse uh, with his helmet off, basically shouting, guys, no, guys, really, look, it's me. I'm still alive. I'm still alive. We, we still got this. Get back into the fight to rally his men, and that's how the Normans were able to um, to win. And if it wasn't for that, though, if he actually had been killed, and actually that's what happened to his opponent, um, Harold Godwinson, Harold Godwinson had been killed, and the Saxon resistance just collapsed. So having a leader just by sheer happenstance, you know, in this particular case, taking an arrow to the eye, it was enough to just break the morale of the of that army, and that was it. Yeah, that was the end of it. And this happened many, many times throughout history. I, you know, your, your general or your leader dies. And you, well, morale breaks and the army breaks with it. So that's just strange happenstance that could lead to victory. And again, it has nothing to do with any other particular factors, whether it's, you know, the high ground or technology or anything else. Or even stuff as simple as did your troops eat breakfast that morning? For example, Hannibal did. It was very good at this. When he was fighting against the Romans, he would stack up these smaller little things on top of themselves to lead to a great victory. For example, he would make sure his troops were well fed and had a good breakfast, and they would stand next to bonfires in, in freezing cold temperatures to stay warm, and then he would provoke the Romans to attacking, and then they would cross over this frozen river. I think this was at, um, was it at Trasimene? I think it was at Trasimene. No, was it Trasimene? I can't keep track of them. It, it's I haven't studied the Punic Wars in a while. But basically, he provoked the Romans into crossing over a frozen lake early in the morning before the Romans had a chance to eat breakfast. So the Romans were, were hungry, they were cold, and they were now like soaking wet and just like absolutely miserable, as you can imagine. And on the other side were the well-rested, well-fed, uh, warm, um, and prepared Carthaginians who were just able to trounce them. So the Romans had a numerical advantage, but they, well, they were defeated because, again, these small things. He would also, uh, for example, position himself in such a way that he would position his army that the sun would be in the Romans' eyes and it would blind them and give them, the Carthaginians, just that little bit of an advantage. So all these things do stack up, and um, he was really just a master at that. There are just tons of other little minor factors that I can't think of but can lead to victory. So the point that I'm trying to make here is that although technology in the theme of technology and innovation being the key to victory is true, and yes, having superior technology does help, uh, no, nobody will deny that. It's not the only factor. So uh, as I go forward with this video about um, or with this series about early modern warfare and that of constant innovation, just keep in mind that although technology is important, it's not the only way to achieve victory. And uh, for example, uh, we're going to be talking about in the very near future about flintlocks versus matchlocks and at the Battle of Fontenoy. The British had flintlocks, which are the which is the superior technology, and they're going to be fighting against the French, who were still using matchlocks at the time, but the French vastly outnumbered the British and were able to repel them. So does this mean that flintlocks are inferior or some way flawed compared to a matchlock? No. I, I, if I was going to battle, I'd rather take a flintlock over a matchlock, but there were other circumstances, in this particular case numbers, which led to uh, a French victory. So... Yeah, I guess the point I'm trying to say is that it's an important factor, and that's what I'm going to be focusing on and have been focusing on this whole time, this one of innovation, but it's not the only factor, and as always with everything, exceptions do apply. So, yeah, just a real quick video. I did this completely off the cuff. You know, I did put a few notes down to make sure I got a few points in here, but this is really just an informal thing I just want to put out there uh, just for the sake of doing so. Any case, um, yeah, that's it. A more formal history video will be coming out shortly. I know with the coronavirus, everybody's in lockdown. I am not, and I'm actually working a lot more than I have been previously, so I'm not able to put out videos as quickly as I would have liked to. But, um, yeah, I'm doing what I can. Any case, new videos will be coming out whenever I do get around to it. And um, please hit the like and subscribe button. Help me out here. I do not get paid at all. I am demonetized till I get a thousand subscribers, so please hit the like and subscribe button. Share this with your friends, share it with your enemies, share my channel with them, help me out, guys. Um, yeah, and that's pretty much it. And have a good day, or don't have a good day. Your adults have any kind of day you want. See you later.